I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Roger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast. I am Amy Shira Title. With me, as always, is my co host. I'm Jason McClellan. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. And I'm going to jump right into it, Amy. Let's get to the beer. Yeah, we're going to, well, we're, we're going to say hi to Lyle real quick first. Just say hi, Lyle. Hi, Lyle. Hi, Lyle. Okay, good. We've got Lyle, but we're also all just like angling for beer. So we're going to, we're going to crack. Do you want to just crack the beer right away, start drinking and then talk about the beer? Yes. That's such a great idea. Let's just do that. Let's get to the beer faster. Ready? And nailed it. (laughs) Awesome. What do you have, Amy? I'm the only one drinking a massive beer today. No. uh, It looks like we've got two massive. I've got a big one too. Awesome. Okay. I've got the Mammoth Brewing Company Elderberry Sour. I'll show the beautiful label to those of you watching the video version of this and apologize for my voice that's going to cut out. Um, this I've had this before and it is like, I'm not a huge fan of sours, but this is like a tart sour. It is so good. Um, and I am super excited to pour this right now. Um, Jason, what are you drinking? so awesome. I really want to try that. <laughs> One uh, of these days we will get you this beer because yes. you would love it. Oh, that sounds awesome. Well, I am drinking a beer that uh, is related very similar to a beer that I've had previously on the show, but this is Santan Brewing's Moon Juice. Um, I've had the Galactic IPA on the show before, but this one is the Galactic Grapefruit IPA. So, got that going today. What about you, Lyle? Uh, today, I am drinking uh, the Abyss. This is their 2015 edition, and this is uh, a special aged in rye barrels. Um, it's a dark, dark, delicious beer, and I love it so much. Who's the brewer on Actually, that? I've, I've never actually... Oh, uh, sorry. This is from Deschutes. Oh, nice. Um, mm, up in Oregon. Yeah. So I've, I've not had this, but I've been drinking The Abyss for years. It's it's a seasonal release. and That's uh, awesome. We're, we're, nice. we're Deschutes fans here on the show. Yeah, we have <laughs> talked about that brewery before. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. And uh, let's get to it. So hang on. Cheers. I have to... Mm. Oh, my God. This beer is so good. Oh. All right. So I guess we got I'm to start. I'm already jealous. And talk about <laughs> one of these days. Um, we got. I guess we should start and talk about why I know Lyle because Lyle, I you you got dragged into this by me. Um, <laughs> I don't remember. I guess I just met you through like JPL people out here. So let's uh, let's tell people what it is that you do. You describe it because I never really know how to describe what you do because you always talk about like melting ice on camera and wearing costumes on green screens to scare children. Um, Go on, so, prove so me wrong. I, I will say that uh, I do describe it halfway that way. Uh, generally, I don't include the dressing in costumes in green screens to scare children, but that is how some other people describe it. Um, so I, I am, uh, I do a couple different things, and it's probably hard for you to describe it because it's also hard for me to describe it. So. I essentially take what we do at JPL in terms of missions and and projects and things like that, and I turn it into lessons that teachers can then use to teach math and science in their classroom. So instead of, uh, you know, reading a book or a chapter or whatever about Newton's laws and, you know, whatever they are, they can do this lesson where they'll calculate the speed uh, or the acceleration of a spacecraft according to Newton's laws, um, or, or if they're not quite at that level, we've got other stuff. Um, for them to do as well. So that's everything from creating the lessons to training teachers how to do it to creating videos that demonstrate uh, whatever it is that we're trying to do. So it's kind of all over the place, but it does occasionally involve uh, video conferencing to schools wherever and um, talking to kids about space and how cool it is. Yeah. And you do this from where? Uh, I do this from JPL. Oh, oh, I see what you're getting at here. (laughs) So See see what I did there? (laughs) The studio itself happens to be in a basement, um, and see, you sit around in a basement dressing up for ca- for children on camera. Uh, it's not that sketchy, but uh, yeah, okay. And it's a well lit basement, <laughs> as as studios are yeah. wont to be. I mean, yes. you want a, a basement studio that's not going to have like rumbling motorcycles from outside or anything. 
interrupting your filming because that's annoying to anybody who's ever worked in a studio that's not soundproofed. Um, okay. And in your spare time, the other reason we wanted to talk to you is you make beer. I do make beer, and I really like making beer. Um, most The most recent thing I made is actually not a beer. It's a cider, but it, it turned out pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I've been making beer for probably about five years, almost six years maybe. Um, and I'm happy to say I'm getting better at it. That's good. It's that you're, you're going the right way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some yeah, people, yeah. I feel, don't go that way, so... Yeah, I feel like the people that, you know, get excited about making good beer and then try to make more beer while drinking the first beer just make bad drunk beer. Yeah, drunk beer is not good. Step number one in making beer is actually opening a beer and drinking it. Uh, The the trick is you then don't want to continue drinking so much beer that you end up making terrible beer. So um, drinking beer is in the the rules of making beer, but um, to, to a point. Do you have Trade a favorite secrets, style? I feel like uh, to make or to drink. To, to make, uh, I would say the one I've had the most success with um, are, are Belgians, and I think maybe it's because the the strong Belgian flavors uh, might overpower some of the mistakes that I make in brewing. Hmm. Uh, but uh, they're they're probably my favorites to make. Um, but I've made uh, I've made a porter, I've made uh, an Irish stout, I made a honey ale. Um, I've done a couple others as well, but I would say the one I've, the one I've actually made several times is the, uh, Belgian IPA, which is when I first thought about that combination, I thought, well, that's a weird combination, but it works. So I stick with it. Nice. Okay. And then since you brought it up, how about to drink? Favorite to drink. Hold on. That's my dog. Oh sorry. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we do talk about pets on this show. Yes, we are and a pet of, friendly that show. That is your dog. So. Einstein. So if Einstein would like to come and say hello, (laughs) he's welcome to. (laughs) Einstein's pretty cute. Hey. Einstein, look over here, bud. Hey, bud. Hi. Look at that little face. Does Einstein help you you brew beer? Hi. He he helps me brew beer and that like he follows me around and makes sure I'm I'm thank you, bud. Thank you so much. That's gross. Um (laughs) he helps me he helps me to brew beer and that he follows me around the kitchen and makes sure that I don't drop anything. Or spill anything, and if I do, he he's there to clean it up. Awesome. That's a good partner. Yeah. That's exactly. That sounds like exactly what you want in a little helper. Yeah. Um, but he's not a big beer drinker. Mm. I did have a probably beer... for the best. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Uh, and I don't say that. And like I've tried to offer him beers, and he's like, "No, thanks. I'm driving." It's more like he uh, he was home alone when a beer that I was brewing exploded as it was oh, wow. uh, conditioning in the bottle, and it spilled all over the floor. Uh, he had a golden opportunity to uh, lap that up, and he just kind of left it alone. Hmm. So uh, I don't know what that How says about that. How responsible of him. Right? Yeah. I don't know. I wonder where he picked up a sense of responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because um, there are um, beers and wines now that people make that are made specifically for animals. Yeah. Is there a beer or wine for dogs? Because I know there's a cat lady wine, and I kind of want to get it. It's just like... I think I don't I've know only what seen cat is, stuff. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's I've, like. I've, I've actually seen it's called dog brew and it's non alcoholic for your dog and you buy it in a six pack and you like pour it into their bowl and it's it's made with some of the same ingredients as beer, but they don't go, the, go through the for, uh, fermentation process. Yeah. So um, but, I don't know. I guess it'd kind of be like giving your dog an O'Doul's or something. But what does it do? Like, what is the point of a beer for dogs like the, the point cat is to make the owner catnip. feel like hey <laughs> got my buddy here we're gonna have have a drink oh yeah it's totally for the sure person. that's why the cat wine exists because yeah. it's not cat beer it's cat wine because yeah. cat ladies don't drink beer they just drink <laughs> boxes <laughs> of wine right <laughs> um, so wait does, so that, does, cat, that does cat beer come in a box no, it's like tiny little. I've okay. I, I I sound like an expert, but I have not actually bought it. Apparently, it's like eight ounce little mini wine bottles of catnip wine, and you can like pour it into a glass for your cat, and then you and your cat can sit and have have drunk times together because it's catnip. So then they just get really high. <laughs> well, if Pete's listening, you totally kind of like amazing. made yourself have to get it now. Pete's totally you know, gonna want I, it. Kind of, he does. He does sometimes like lose his mind with catnip. And if I yeah. could do that on a regular basis while I drink, I mean, it would just be, that would be like <laughs> video worthy, weird night in, I feel, 
in like I, the best and worst ways at the same time. <laughs> there's definitely not a benefit to the dog like there is for the cat with the catnip, uh, but he probably gets excited in that I have something in my hands and then I give it to him. Yeah. And that's right. really all he wants in life other than to cuddle next to me or for me to rub his head. So it's in the top right. three. <laughs> so as a brewer and also a fan of beer, do you, I know this is a tough question, but is it possible for you to single out and identify a brewery right now that is um, either your favorite or one of your favorites? Um, I could probably do that. Uh, so I really love sour beers. Uh, and I think the place that I, I, at least locally here in Southern California, that's making the best sour beer is probably the brewery. Um, they've actually branched off and created a secondary brewery. Uh, I think it's pronounced brewery to row or something mm. like that. Uh, and, and that is specifically sours. And my understanding is they, they were worried about contamination from their souring bacteria. Mm. They didn't want that to get into any of their non sour beers. So that's why they created this, the secondary brewery. Uh, but I like it so much that I have joined up. So I get a, a, a quarterly shipment of beer from them. That's awesome. uh, and I, I don't do that with any other brewery. So I'm nice. pretty happy with their stuff. That was, had I not gone with the abyss and this was more for a, uh, political reason because of, um, inauguration day. Um, I, I probably would have had a beer from the brewery with me today. Yes. And for those watching and listening, we are time travelers again, and we are recording this episode all the way back in January on inauguration day. So just yeah. so you know, and oh, was I not supposed to say that? No, no, no. That's, no, that's no, the magic it's... of our show. So we, we, we happily let people know that because sometimes we throw things out that probably sound a little confusing to people listening to this, uh, two months in the future. Yeah. Um, but see that, that I'm a big sour guy. I, I love sours. They're my favorites right now, but they're also my curse because I love them so much, but I'm vegan and <laughs> so many, you know, sours, uh, you know, they use, um, what do they use? Yogurts and, and other oh, really? other think? things to to that the cultures to yeah do whatever sours well, do. At what point I say this as the one who does not know how to make beer? At what point in the brewing process would you have yogurt involved in a sour? What? So uh, how? <laughs> <laughs> my guess is that the put the on a yogurt... costume and teach us. <laughs> Well, let me get my yogurt costume out, and um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that please. That's horrifying. So my, that would be my, amazing my beer guess, education videos. I like that. Yeah. Huh. My God, this okay. is such an untapped market. All right, I got to write this down. Um, <laughs> we'll team up. Let's I'll, do it. I'll, I'll give you credit for sure. All right. Not monetary, just like thank you guys. I appreciate that. Just like um, like a like a high five every time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Um, um, the yogurt. Yeah, I actually hadn't heard that. But if I had to guess, I would say that they're using the bacteria in the yogurt as a souring agent. Yeah. Um, because it produces if you've ever had like unflavored, straight, plain yogurt, uh, if it's made with the right bacteria, it's really sour. Mm. Uh, so that that's probably where it would go in. And generally a sour is brewed uh, just as a regular beer. And then they add in the souring bacteria and then it's aged for another year, maybe something like that where it gets sour. So uh, I, I don't know if they just like take a scoop of yogurt and pop it in there or what they do, but um, now I'm really curious. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how or when they do it, but I also know that some sours, they're, they're also um, casked, it, the cask process, and a lot of cask beers, almost all cask beers, are not vegan-friendly either, um, as a lot of other alcohol for the same reason, and that's in the, the finishing process with the Innis glass. In his oh, glass, yeah, for those who that. don't know, is fish uh, fish bladder, the swim bladder. So fish stomachs, basically, they use to uh, in the finishing process as filtration. Yeah, that, really? that's still something. Yeah, so, they use that a lot in uh, British beers still. They do in British not, beers, not as, um, a lot of wines. In the US, but wines, yeah, wines they do. use a lot too. Um, but Guinness <laughs> um, uses that, and they, they won't... Um, in the near future. They started the process. They were hoping to, in late 2016, have it finished in their um, Ireland brewery, the St. Uh, whatever it is, brewery, um, their main brewery, and the one that the U.S. primarily gets their shipments from. They were changing their, their finishing process so Guinness would finally be vegan. It was supposed to happen at the end of 2016, but they're still working on it, so that'll come this year. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, yeah usually when I think of vegan beers, I think, okay, not a milk stout, not honey. Right. 
but I, yeah, I often forget about the, the, I yeah, the finishing no, product. I, yeah, for sure. I don't under, how does that even work? I don't understand what, what a fish, fish bladder. What? Yeah. I mean, they, they take it and they basically make it into like a gelatin type substance. And uh, yeah, I don't really understand the, the, the whole process and I'm sure plenty of people in the comments can uh, fill us in, but Probably. yeah, no, it, it, that seems it, like it's, one of those glasses used quite commonly in, in alcohol. That seems like one of those things, like, how did somebody come up with that idea? How did somebody realize, like, oh, how do we, how do we, like, do this little bit of the process? Oh, definitely a fish bladder, obviously. I don't know. Let's try, like, a, let's try a swim bladder. Yeah. I don't know they, how they, things they, happen. But... They were trying to be really efficient with the fish and use every part. And I thought, oh, we got this fish bladder left. What are we going to do with it? Yeah, yeah but let's throw it in the why beer are people making beer, like, using parts on a fish? Like, did they That's... make fish beer? <laughs> and then, like... <laughs> Well, we got another part it we haven't used. It must be a good it's... fish stout. Like... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I want the answer to that. No. No, let's not no. dig too deep. That's awful. That's but I will throw nice. this out there. There is a fantastic website called Barnivore, barnivore.com. And that is a website where you can go and find out all of your alcohol needs to find out um, if if your wine, your your liquor, your beer is vegan. So, Hooray for vegan friendly alcohol. Vegan friendly. So, does that include? Again, I know so little about how beer is made, but I do know that a lot of like lower ABV, like lambics and stuff, are are open air fermented with just like bacteria in the air. Like, does is that a problem for vegans? Depends on who you At talk to. Point? I mean, I okay. Typically, no bacteria are are just fine. But okay. uh, yeah, some some hardcore vegans, you know, have a problem with bacteria as well. But because I feel like because if it's open air, then like anything can get in mm -hmm. there. Yeah, that's right. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. interesting. And what's interesting about those open air ones is different environments around the country and around the world have different native yeast and bacteria yeah. that just sort of float through the air, and so you get different flavors depending on mm -hmm. what you're going to get, which is where the Belgian uh, yeast strains originated, is uh, just from that particular region. Yeah. Yep. Beer is so complex and fun. I love beer. Isn't it great? It is. One of these days I do want to make beer. Just to, just to understand what exactly is going on. Anytime oh. you want, just come on over. We'll I know, make some beer. I know. I've we got some do that. ingredients right now. So. so how big a setup do you have in your house? I know you can do like the tiny little at-home kits that like make a six-pack worth of beer. Or you can do like the full out and end up with a keg like how big is your setup how much of your house or your garage does this actually take up to do so uh, I, I make five gallons at a time mm. and that's not bad it it fills up my counter as I'm making it but once I have made it and it's fermenting it's just a five gallon bucket that I keep on my counter um, and then I you know I move it into another five gallon vessel so not a whole lot when I'm not in the process of making the beer and then as far as equipment, I've got a couple of big Rubbermaid tubs that I keep in the garage, and that holds most of the stuff. I could definitely buy more uh, and take up a whole lot more space, but in terms of just kind of a straight setup that gets gets the job done, not, not a whole lot. Nice. Yeah, it's got to be nice to do that and not have it, like, take over your entire house. Yeah. Because then your what entire I... house will smell like a, like a crusty old bar at the end of a really long night. Only if I spill a lot. So. Yeah, but see, then I just wonder if the first step of beer, making beer, is opening a beer and drinking a beer. By the end of making the beer, aren't you like kind of drunk enough to maybe be spilling the beer? <laughs> well, there is there is that, yeah, and there's that's what Einstein is there for, I guess. But uh, and at that point, it's non-alcoholic, so he's, he's fine with that. <laughs> right. The the real trouble actually Good. comes in once I've made five gallons of beer and I put it into bottles. Then I have five gallons of beer in bottles that I have to put somewhere, and uh, I can only give away so much before I run out of people to give beer to, yeah. which means my refrigerator is stock full of beer and maybe like a head of broccoli. I'm so sorry for your hardship. Yeah, <laughs> that is a tough situation, and that's why some people, you know, when they have the space, if they've got like a garage or something, they'll have that beer fridge in the garage that's just devoted to beer. That'd be you nice. know, I, I, I have, it's not a full size refrigerator in there, but it is one of those temperature controlled. It's made for wine, but mm -hmm. I took the wine racks out and now it's full of beer. That's nice. awesome. Yeah. I've got one of those too, where like I've got a top shelf in there and I've got some wine in there, but the rest of it completely beer. <laughs> yeah. I got a great deal on it. Somebody was moving down the street and nice. wanted to get rid of it. So 
Awesome. I needed a place to put beer, and now I have one. Yay. It's, good. it's a good way to be. It's a good way to be. Um, beer. I kind of just wanted to ask you about space now. Wait. I can have a segue for this. I can segue. Have you ever tried? Do did you ever get to try uh, the Ninkasi uh, Ground Control beer? Speaking so of beer was... that is brewed with yeast that flew into space. So uh, yes, and in fact, that was my third choice for today. I have a bottle of it. Do you really? My, nice. Uh, nice. I do. Yeah, uh, and I thought about bringing it out just because it would fit with the theme so nicely. Um, but yeah, I love it. Um, I grew up in well, not in, but outside of Eugene, where Ninkasi is brewed. So every time I go home. Uh, it's a real quick, easy trip to the Nkasi Brewery. Um, and uh, once I was flying home and Nkasi was actually at the airport giving out samples to people who wanted to try their beer, wow. uh, which does not happen at LAX. So, no. yeah, you got to pay a premium for beer there. Uh, but, yeah, so I do I do really like ground control. Um, if you haven't had it, it's delicious. And, it's yeah, it's not just a novelty. It's really good beer. It is good beer. I also That's have awesome. a bottle sitting on my shelf that I just, I keep feeling like, because they sponsored a, a series of videos on my YouTube channel, and I keep, like, they send me a bottle every year, I guess, which is awesome. Cool. And I just, like, I feel like I never know where to find it, so I'm like, I should save this for something special, yeah. and so I just, like, sit there and stare at it all the time. Um, yeah, one of these days I'll drink it. But, um, so, yeah, that is beer that was made with yeast launched into space, and... I'm going to do a second segue on top of that segue because I just remembered my one of my favorite stories about you um, is that one night you uh -oh. went out drinking and had maybe too much beer and then fell asleep inside a space shuttle engine. <laughs> this this may or may not have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, if you're uh, allowed to say that story. <laughs> there, was a, there was a time in my life where I worked somewhere um, that... Can you uh, say where? Sure, why not? I, I don't. I, mean, it's, I don't. It's your I don't, podcast, right? You can. Oh no, you can. Too. Yeah, no, you can say whatever you want. I mean, all right. Yeah. So I, I used to work at Space Camp, and um, I always wanted to, be, to to go to Space Camp when I was a kid. And it turns out working there is better because you can go on the simulators whenever you want. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, so hopefully nobody at Space Camp is gonna, you know, really hate me for this. But um, I got out with you friends. ten years after the fact. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, take away my official status unofficial yep. steps um yeah so uh went out with some with some friends and had some drinks and uh because i was living well, i was living on base at space camp um which is something they provided for people who were coming from out of state and didn't have housing uh so um i went back home and i was walking and i sat down they have a they have a space shuttle main engine on display there underneath their big pathfinder space shuttle um, display and I was just kind of sitting there and I got a little sleepy um, and then I woke up a little while later so and is this an, an engine that has flown or is it like a test engine what kind of engine if, are we talking if, that you fell asleep in <laughs> if I remember correctly it was an engine from STS-1 uh, so if you're unfamiliar that is the very first space shuttle flight um, and it flew on some other missions, but um, they, they have a limited number of minutes that they can be fired and then they're taken off and replaced with new engines. So, uh, yeah, that one, if I remember correctly, was STS-1, one of the three. Nice. That's definitely paying respect to an artifact of history in the best possible way. <laughs> so it sort of yeah. combines my, my love for beer as well as my love for taking naps because I do enjoy that as well. I thought you were going to say your love for beer and your love of space, but no, you went for your love of naps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it combines um, three things that I love. There you go. So um, why don't you talk a little bit, tell us a little bit about uh, working at space camp. Like, I've never been to space camp. Jason, did you ever go to space camp? No. No. I always wanted to go Me to space too. camp. I also didn't learn that space camp was a thing until I was like 20. We should start um, a space camp for adults. I, I have good news for both of you. There is space camp for adults. Is there? Yes. And there there have actually been a few groups of people that I know who've made uh, a trip out for the summer to do adult space camp. Mm. Um, in fact, when I was there, uh, boy, I'm going to forget who it was, some celebrity who was really popular at the time she was making movies, she paid for her whole family to come out and do a week of space camp. Wow. And that's that's what they did. Um, is so, there yeah, beer at uh, space camp? Uh, there's beer outside of space camp. 
Uh, yeah, so Space Camp is actually part of a, a, a NASA visitor center, and it's mm. it's sort of on the edge of the Marshall Space Flight Center. Okay. So um, once you once you go uh, outside, and there is a Marriott or some hotel right next door um, that the adults stay in when they go to Space Camp. So that's that's where the the beer would come in, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so working at Space Camp was actually a lot of fun. Uh, you basically uh, work either sort of a, a morning afternoon shift or an afternoon into the evening shift. And, uh, you work with, uh, another space camp counselor and you take kids, uh, anywhere from, I think the youngest kids were usually like third or fourth grade. And then it went up into the middle school grades and high school grades There's space camp. And then there's space academy and then there's mm. advanced space academy for the older kids. Um, and essentially you, you, you work with these kids, you teach them all about space history, uh, you teach them about um, elements of the mission. When I was there, the uh, space shuttle was still flying, and so when we would uh, assign kids to a mission, uh, one kid would be assigned the commander position, and one would be a pilot, and then we'd have mission specialists, and they would basically learn the role of what those astronauts did during a mission, and then during the simulated missions, they would have to carry out those roles. Um, there were also space station missions as well for some mm-hmm. of the, uh, I think, the advanced and the space academy kids as well, uh, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. We did missions to Mars, we did uh, space station missions, we did shuttle missions, uh, and it was just it was a whole lot of fun. And there's a Saturn V there, and that was the first Saturn V that I ever got to see. And when I went there, it was outside. If you've been there recently, it's in a beautiful display. Uh, I forget what the building is called, but when I was there, they were just starting a campaign to raise money to move it from outdoor where it was getting rained on and it was you know, growing some mold and other green things on it. Um, and there was the first campaign to bring it inside. So mm-hmm. one of the things that you would do when you were walking the kids around the rocket garden is you'd start at one end of the Saturn V and you'd walk all the way to the other end talking about the different pieces. And it's right there and it's huge and it's awesome. Um, so it's since moved inside, which is really awesome. Uh, and I keep saying the word awesome. And I use that Saturn word. Saturn five is awesome. It is awesome. And I realized that I used that word too liberally when I f- saw my first space shuttle launch because that was truly awesome. And I try not to say it as much, but Saturn five is definitely awesome. Hmm. And they have a full scale model that's vertical there. Hmm. And when I was starting my job there, I, I was driving across the country from Oregon and I called to try to get directions because this was before the days of Google Maps. And they said, well, just get on this such and such freeway and then follow the rocket. And I said, what? And she said, you'll, you'll see. And sure enough, from several miles away, you're on this freeway and you see a Saturn V off in the distance and you just drive towards it. Wow. Yeah, oh, that's so cool. it, was, it was a trip. Nice. Yeah, if anyone out there is a space fan and has not seen a Saturn V, I would highly, highly recommend getting yourself to a NASA center to see one because it is, like, ridiculous how massive that rocket is. It's just, like, it is it is truly, like, awe-inspiring. It is amazing. Yeah, there, there are three of them. There's one at the Johnson Space Center. There's one in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. And then there's one at uh, Space Camp in Huntsville. Um, and... Yeah, the way the way that they've got it set up is great because you walk in and your jaw just short, sort of hits the floor because the first thing you see are those massive engines. I love when they do that. It's just like you walk in, you're like, "That's the business end of a rocket right there," and then you just imagine all that fire just like pouring out yeah. of that engine. You're just like, "Oh, that's power. That is just raw, raw rocket power. It's awesome." Yeah. Yeah. And then and then then you can turn around and watch people come in and do the same thing. And be amazed when they come in yeah. and just like jaw yeah. drops. Jason, have you seen a Saturn V? No, no, I haven't. That's got to be on your list then. One of these days. Well, when you go to space camp, you'll see it. Yay! Yes. Yeah. I've got to figure space out how to camp. make that happen. Space camp. That sounds it good. Be... It sounds good, right, Amy? I don't know. It sounds really good. I. Yeah. I feel like, especially if you could get a little group of people together yeah. to do like a big space camp summer vacation. Yeah, that would be rad. Could do it would that. be kind of awesome. It's like what? <laughs> Coughing. Um, what do adults do at space camp versus kids at space camp? Like, do they do the same? Like, go through missions, like play Gene Kranz and like put on a white vest and be mission controller, like, 
or did, is there like a difference of like space camp for kids is more like teaching you fundamentals of physics and then for the adults it's like clearly you're here because you're a nerd so just like go to mars you know i i think it's 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 very similar in terms of what you're doing there because um if you are if you're if you're an adult nerd who loves space you might want to go to space camp and learn about the history that maybe you didn't know about maybe Maybe you love space and you love space travel and you're fascinated by it, but you don't know the history of it or the details. Mm-hmm. And, and that is something that, that you can get. Um, of course, they gear it differently because adults learn differently and, and because their, their attention spans are different than kids and things like that. But um, yeah, yeah, I think it would be a lot of fun to, to do that. Um, How long is space camp? Five or six days, I'd have mm. to... I'm trying to remember mm. what it was, but well, we'll have yeah, to look usually, into this. Yeah, it's, or maybe it's, we'll start uh, our own, Amy. I feel like it would be hard to do it without all the fancy NASA simulators. <laughs> I so, mean, you could definitely yeah, but, do but it. You, like, could, you could add beer, and then uh, I, I don't know. That would make some of it be, okay. I don't know. So now, what I'm imagining is we like, like get it, like rent out a small like studio space and outfit it to look like a space shuttle. And make people drink a lot of beer before they get into it and just like shake the walls. Yes. So they feel like they're actually in space, but really they're just drunk and a little bit like woozy eyed. Yes. And tell people so they have like, to wear like space costumes. No, it'd be a good time. Yeah. It's like space camp space camp for drunk grown ups is basically what <laughs> is in my head right now. Which I'm honestly not not uh, against in any way. <laughs> no, we can get people on board. We'll have our own our, our own patches and stuff. It'll be great. No. Yeah, we could make our own fake space agency just yep. for the sake of drunk adult space camp. And this has to happen in and Vegas, like, right? I, I think it's called Dask Drunk Adult Space Camp. Yeah, that's your Dask, acronym. Yeah, right there. and it you're totally right. It absolutely has to be in Vegas because because then you get outside and it's basically an alien world. It's perfect. No, <laughs> so there there actually used awesome. to be a West Coast space camp here in L.A. It was sort hmm. of a temporary thing, and I think they were considering making it more permanent but um the big draw was to huntsville and it just it never took off here Hmm. that's too bad so maybe there's equipment somewhere in a closet that could be used for your las vegas project well you're the one at jpl every day go hunt through some weird untapped hallways or something i don't know it has to be somewhere that's got like a like a motion theater that we can rent too just like shake and yeah, yeah, I mean, this is Hollywood, right? That's so. right. Anything is possible in Hollywood. Ah, right? great, great plans, guys. Great plans. I like this. We've already come up with like several things we're going to do here. We have, no. we have beer, yeah. beer education know. videos. We've got adult space camp. Yeah. <laughs> we're recording this, right? So <laughs> we won't forget. That's right. I was just going <laughs> to say, good. someone should have been taking notes because I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this episode to remember all of our brilliant space and beer based ideas. Yes. Yeah. So um, so yeah. has, has beer been so, brewed in space? Can that happen? Um, I don't. I don't think it has. Um, I, I I could be totally wrong here. Um, I know there's been coffee in space. I know there's been soda in space. Yeah. Generally, soda in space and carbonated beverages are not a good idea hmm. um, because the the bubbles in your stomach on Earth are less dense and float to the top, and then you can burp. But in space, you just kind of puke a little bit. <laughs> Um, cause it's That's just sort of good. spread everywhere. Uh, so yeah, generally not a good idea to have anything carbonated. I, they did I try carbonation in space think. though. I did remember, they? I can't remember when, but they, yes, it was a Coca-Cola like sponsored yeah. this thing where they sent like a special carbonated version of a can of Coke for astronauts to like drink with a special straw and stuff. And it was like a giant marketing gimmick, but apparently it just like didn't really work very well. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you're allowed alcohol in space is the real issue. Yeah. What do you mean you're not allowed? Who's forbidding this? Is NASA. it a NASA regulation? The government? I think so. I think that's the case. I know. Well, I've researched this. I'm not, I'm not with NASA. I'm not... I don't so I'm do. pretty sure I'm pretty sure the Russian space agency probably like sends up alcohol in small Yeah, and see vodka. that's probably I, the thing. Like they they may have distilled vodka in space. I wish wish we knew about that. But distilling might be be a more feasible thing than brewing. Well, the trick with with drinking just about anything in space is it's it's not this satisfying mug of of whatever you're you're sipping it through a straw. Yeah. Until recently, until recently, I don't know if you're aware of this 
really awesome cup that was designed. Um, <laughs> yeah. It uses it uses capillary action to draw liquid to the top rather than um, gravity yep. where you where you spill it. So um, they've actually I've seen them online now where you can buy them. Yep, I've and seen them too. Have them for yourself here. But my understanding is That's the way necessary. that they're designed doesn't actually work on Earth. They they really only Weird. work in space. Yeah. So if you have them for your house, they're really just a nice table piece or something. Yeah, because capillary you have to action all over yourself to get it out. Yeah, you need like a super tiny tube, and it's not you're not going to get that much suction out of it. Yeah. I weirdly looked into this for my grade six science fair project, and I traced <laughs> how far what colored water will go up the capillaries in uh, celery stalks. Hmm. I was awesome when I was twelve. <laughs> yeah, what but, happened? Um, uh, I just became more of a nerd, but not in the good ways. Um, yeah, can't astronauts drink in space? I actually did a video on this, and I will t make a mental note to put a card in yes, the video at this point. Um, Can you point and be like, "Here it is." The and then card there? will be in the this corner, all the way at the end. Whoever who who's ever faces in this corner, it'll be over their face, <laughs> right up here. But um, yeah, I looked into the regulations of whether or not you can drink in space. Um, and I think, I think the answer was no, cause of like compromising the mission success and stuff. But, uh, but again, yeah, you're talking I, I think specifically NASA about regulation. NASA. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I am. And I think, I think the Soviets do allow, I remember reading something about Soviets having some kind of vodka. That's awesome. Cause it, I'm sorry, Pete just fell off my desk. That was kind of amazing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my desk is covered in stuff. So whenever he goes on like the pile of stuff that's like a little bit unbalanced, it just starts to fall, and then he just like flops onto the floor. This is such a successful show today so far. We've we've had two <laughs> two animal appearances. This is great. Yeah, two animal appearances and plenty of beer and very little like educational talk about space. Maybe we should do more of that. <laughs> um, educational. I mean, I can, I can, I can. Oh, more educational content. I thought you meant more pets. I was going to say I can. Bring Einstein back over you here. You bring Einstein. That's always welcome. Matt. Yes. Push right here. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> and he's gonna bump his head so, into the mic, and we're gonna get a little pickup. Of so, up. does Einstein um, actually like see and recognize things that are on screens? Uh, you know, I once showed him an article that was about how squirrels ended up in Central Park mm -hmm. in such large numbers, because I thought Wait. it would be really funny to take a picture of him looking at a computer, yeah. pretending to read an article about squirrels. Mm -hmm. Um, and he just sort of stared at it and he does recognize things on screens. He generally doesn't pay attention to screens, but when he is looking at them, um, he notices them. The first time he noticed something on screens was when I was watching some, I think it was some documentary about Yellowstone and there were wolves on the screen and mm. he mm. was fascinated by them. But generally he doesn't, he doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to the screen because it doesn't pet him or give right. him food. That's so fascinating to me because, I mean, clearly some animals can see things and, and recognize when things are happening on screens and, and others can't. And, and I've read some different differing opinions about with, with dogs specifically about it has to do with the, the breed of dog and like the, the location of their mm. eyes, whether they're like sight hounds or like where, the position really? of, of the eyes on the head. But you know, I, I don't buy into that because, you know, with personal experience with similar or same breed types, you know, one will be absolutely enthralled with anything that goes on the screen and like, we'll sit there and scratch at the screen and follow things that are going on and others will like not see anything at all. You know, even so far as like trying to get them interested in a Skype call or something with somebody they know and like, look, who's that? And, you know, not that even, was not even, be my next question not even <laughs> hearing the, the sound coming out of the phone or anything on speakerphone, yeah. you know, some dogs just like, and probably cats too, just like, absolutely. They, they don't, they don't, they're not tuned in. They don't have that in their radar as something that they need to pay attention to or that, that something's going on. But others are absolutely like, mm. wow, something's going on there. I need to get in there. What's going on? Let that dog out of yeah. that TV screen. Yeah. yeah. A friend of mine, when she got a dog, she sent me a video of her dog. And um, I played the video on my phone and I put the phone on the floor thinking Einstein would be maybe interested in yeah. this little tiny dog behind this glass screen on the floor. And he, he didn't really care. The thing that he pays most attention to are the sounds, specifically mm. doorbells off coming oh, wow. from the TV. Yeah. 
and more specifically the Simpsons doorbell. That really sets him off. Like he <laughs> knows that is a doorbell. <laughs> That's oh my amazing. God, we also all have Simpsons in common. I just realized that. <laughs> um, that. Jason, I was going to ask if you, if because you and your wife have lived separately in various stages of careers and jobs mm-hmm. and life and everything. Have you guys ever tried to like Skype with the dogs? So like you guys are separate. One of you has the dogs. Do they react to that? Cause, yeah, like, no, and my that's... parents do it with with their dog who is my brother um he doesn't respond he can't i mean he's fairly blind now but um he can't thank you pete he can't see me but he can respond to my voice so if i if i you know they they put the phone or the the ipad or whatever nearer to his to his head and i say like hey teddy teddy hi he'll he will sort of look around to see where i am um, but he like my mom will lift him up and put him in front of the screen, but he won't be able to see that it's his sister. Yeah. Now we've That's definitely it. tried that at various various stages in their lives, and they've never, never even responded to to sight or sound. I mean, now they're blind and deaf, so it's not mm-hmm. not uh, worth trying. But uh, yeah, when they were younger, absolutely nothing. But and they're both Maltese, and uh, my in laws have a Maltese too. And he's significantly younger than my guys are, but um, this guy absolutely loves anything on the TV and on phones. Like if he sees that there's like video playing or something going on on the phone, he gets super interested, will like trot toward it and sit there and like scratch at it and stuff. It's so funny. And sometimes just for laughs, I'll take my phone and put the camera on, you know, and put it to the, the reverse facing camera, the front facing camera and like hold it in front of him so he can see himself. And he just sits there and like, it really confuses him, but he knows there's a dog there and something's going on. It's, it's so funny to watch. That's sort of amazing. Yeah. It's really wild. It's so funny too that the animals have that knowledge. Like there's an animal there and I'm aware that there's an animal there, yeah. but I don't know that that's me. Yeah. It's like that weird lack of self-awareness. But like, of course they wouldn't necessarily have to just, I'm sorry for anybody looking at the video of this. Pete is just loving the like face scratches right here. He's sitting here like a real little spoiled brat and it's amazing. It's so perfect. Um, but yeah, no animals that like don't have that, that, that have the awareness of other animals, but not of themselves. And yeah. it always seems so weird. It's like, yeah, they really do have the brains of like three-year-olds. I've had three-year-olds like don't necessarily have that sense of self-awareness. I think I don't have kids, so I don't know. But like from what I have heard you of do. people with kids, Pete's a kid. But Pete's a kid. Pete's yeah, my kid. <laughs> one of my dogs, um, Odysseus, he has at various points in his life, you know, he, he's good at recognizing other animals and he doesn't necessarily always like other animals. But I remember one time specifically, we were walking in, um, in Flagstaff, Arizona, Northern Arizona, and we were walking by somebody's cabin and they had like a wood carving of a deer or something in their front yard. He saw this wood carving and just freaked the fuck out. Like he just like started barking and tearing and growling at it. You know, what are you doing? You're an idiot. But he could recognize that it was in the, the form of another animal. It was so weird. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Einstein does the same thing if we come across a wooden carving or a really? stone statue of, of an animal. That's yeah. fascinating. I, I, I don't know why. Yeah. But that's just, he recognizes the shape instinctually and it's like, that is not right. <laughs> Do not recognize that. That's... And then he gets very protective of me, I guess. Yeah. Aw, that's pretty cute. Yeah, that's one thing dogs are good for and cats are not is the sort of like being protective of you when there's danger. Like, yeah, yeah, when there's danger and the only danger Pete ever gets to see is like the fire alarm going off in my building. He just hides. He would not rescue me from a burning building. Wake up, Amy. Wake up. Just meh, mom, mom. All right, I'm out. <laughs> Pete out. Um, but he's hanging out with you a lot today. So that's great. I've, Good job, yeah, I've been away for four days and then I had to go out to buy a wig this morning and also it's been running around all over the place. So he's just like, you're here, you're sitting here. Yeah. I'm going to demand love. And he knows that I can't not be petting him because he's so soft. He's like a cloud. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's pretty great. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, I feel like we should get more JPL stories out of you. Because we've gotten a lot of like pet and beer talk, but like you do a lot of cool stuff in space and you're probably more in tune with like what's going on in new space things than either of us are because I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I suppose. How, I mean, I guess. How much in your in your work are you sort of like aware of what sort of the next generation of like deep space mission, planetary mission, Europa, are we still going to there? Like. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Do you get so, to like play with all the cool stuff going on? Or are you sort of like stuck in your basement in your costumes, giving kids lessons <laughs> on how I smell? I feel like I should just clarify some things. I, I'm actually on the first floor now. I just go down to the basement when I need to to be in front of the green screen. I'm sure. moving up. The world. I'm I'm just you know I'm moving up, making progress. It took me five years to get up to the first floor. I figure by the time I retire, I'll I'll be on the top floor run in the place or something like that. So um, in terms of being aware of what's going on, it, it is, um, in a sense, it's sort of my job to know what's going on because I interact with the public and um, do a lot of uh, public talks and Q&A and things like that. And um, being aware of what's going on at JPL is important to what I do, but it's also impossible because there is so much that's going on. And so what I, what I generally do, or what I, what I sort of describe part of my job is, is knocking on doors and saying, hey, what are you doing in here? And can I try? And it, it has led to some really cool opportunities for me. So um, I'll give you an example. There is, uh, there's a building that I've been into countless times, and it's where they, they build um, robotic arms that could potentially go on a future rover or something like that, and they try out different designs and stuff like that. Uh, but if you go in a different door, there is a totally different section, and they're building these balloons that are designed to go to other planets and float in the atmosphere rather than land on the surface. They just float around in whatever air currents there are on, the, on that whatever particular planet they're, they're intending to go to. Um, and I had no idea that this was going on. I just happened to um, find out about it. And that is something that's going on all over JPL. There are all these different buildings. They're pretty nondescript. Uh, one says science. In the front of it. I love um, that building. I don't know what's in there, but it literally just says science in like this beautiful is, 60s script over the door. It's awesome. <laughs> that's what's in there. Science is what's in there. Wow. Um, I know they have an electron microscope in there and uh, they do a lot of tests uh, 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 or experiments about what happens at, at extreme temperatures and extreme pressures with various gases and liquids and things like that. So there, there is definitely science going on in there. Um, but maybe one of the more fun things that uh, I, I got to do was uh, right now I'm, I'm creating a lesson where students are using a uh, visual programming language to essentially create a, a Mars exploration game where they're, they're coding to make a rover that drives around the surface of Mars, collects science uh, targets, and... Um, there's a there's a more to it than that. I won't I won't bore you with all the educational details, but um, I thought well you know a really good way to understand like what goes into a day on Mars and what kind of things these students should be knowing about is to go sit and observe the Curiosity rover uh, operations team. So there there's a a day long meeting very every day pretty much where they decide and make a plan about what the rover Curiosity is going to do on Mars hmm. the following the following day. So it's it's a process that involves a lot of different people, um, both on the engineering side and the science side of things. Um, but it was one of those things where this this really fits my job description and um, getting a better understanding of, of that is really helpful. So um, so there's, there's a bit of that. Um, and sort of unrelated, my brother, who uh, comes to visit from time to time, every time he comes to visit, he wants a tour of JPL. And he's been here, I don't know how many times. And so I sort of take it upon myself to find new things to show him. And so the last time he came to visit, I'm like, who do I know that's doing something cool that I haven't seen and he hasn't seen? Um, and maybe they can show us. And so we got to go see uh, some of the prototypes for the, the Mars 2020 rover um, oh, nice. in terms of the robotic arm that's going to be collecting wow. samples. So unlike the drill, I'm going to, he's getting a little squirmy here. There you go, bud. <laughs> um, unlike the drill on Curiosity, which powders rock samples, this drill is actually going to collect core samples that can mm. be taken out, put into canisters, and then collected by future missions. And so it's a oh. totally different process and a different type of drill and, and all of this. And there's, you know, there's a, a team of people working on that. So we went to go check it out and it was just one of those things like oh and in this building where if you're outside it just you know has a number on it there's this groundbreaking engineering going wow. on in there that ultimately nice. bring back the first rocks from mars wow so there's it's it's a fascinating place to work and everybody is passionate about what they're doing awesome. so they want to talk about what they're doing and so if you ask somebody hey what are you doing in here 
you'll find out. <laughs> and not only that, but there are also lunchtime talks where if you want to go sit in on a talk and hear somebody talk about uh, the performance of dry lubricants at low temperatures on Mars, you can do that. Wow. Or I've if you always wanted to know about the performance of dry lubricants on Mars. Yeah. Who well, <laughs> when it gets really cold, they're they're not as good, but they still work. So yeah. now you know. It's <laughs> actually um, awesome. In your and, educational and efforts, these, oh. in your educational yeah. efforts, do you, do you show the moon any love? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I love the moon. Okay. Good. Um, good. So uh, <laughs> there was actually um, for a time. Almost all of what I did were, were lessons to students. Um, so that's kind of where the green screen video would come in, where mm -hmm. I'd be in the studio and I'd be talking to students all over the country. If you were a, stu if you were a teacher in uh, Minnesota and you wanted your students to learn about states of matter or the sun or the moon or Mars, uh, I would connect in through video conferencing. And one of the most popular ones that I had was a lesson about the moon. So mm -hmm. I definitely um, talked about the moon a lot. And it was a fun one because it was sort of a choose your own adventure. There were, I think, 12 nice. different topics about the moon, and uh, essentially I would let the kids pick which ones they wanted to hear about, and they were they were long enough that you would never, ever get through all 12 in however much time you were talking mm -hmm. about. Usually like two or three um, would be how many different moon topics you could get through. Um, and so not only that, but you're going to get different questions every time, um, and generally the younger the kids are, the more interesting their questions are. Um, just because they're they haven't had as much exposure to things maybe and so they're thinking about the moon differently and i loved it when the little kids would stump me uh, because um, it made me think a little bit about what they were asking but also it gave me the opportunity to say i don't know yeah. and it was good for them to hear that somebody at nasa doesn't know something uh, because that is sort of a, a fallacy that's out there is that yeah. you know nasa is nothing but geniuses who know everything and the truth is there are a lot of questions that we don't have the answers to, and that's why we do what we do, um, to find those answers. And then once we get those answers, um, or not, if we don't get the answers, we have more questions. Yeah. Um, and that's really the process of, of science, and engineering helps us go through that process. So it's, it's good for that, and then you can always say, I don't know the answer. When you grow up, you can come work here and that's help awesome. us find the answer. I love it. Uh, so it's a it's a great way to to get kids motivated about like oh yeah I can do that too, yeah. Um, yeah. and sometimes I might like I realize that the answer exists out there and I don't have it in my brain I can say well uh, you can look that up, and that gives them the the ability to go find information on their own and nice. not necessarily have to count on somebody else giving them whatever information yeah that they're looking for. That's great. So also in your professional opinion as a JPL, okay, no, I should definitely say not as a JPL employee, but as like someone who works and knows space and who works with kids, what are your thoughts on like the unending emphasis on Mars? So, um, I think that Mars is definitely a fascinating, sorry, Einstein found his toy. He knows, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but he knows how to play bit. catch with himself. He takes his toy and he throws <laughs> it in the air and then goes and gets I it. I love and, that. It, he he always Amazing. does it at inopportune times, but um, he's got animals are so good at that. I know. How and does you he know, know what? You're you're on an animal podcast, so it's all good. It's all totally good. appropriate. Good yeah. work, dude. Yeah, he knows what he's yeah. doing. This is the all things go podcast. Yes. All things go. Yeah, there's the grammar. All things go all podcast. Things go. <laughs> That's what they um, say for a rocket launch, right? All things go. All and things they, go now. They blast off. <laughs> Make rocket go now. <laughs> <laughs> um. I mean, as far as as far as Mars goes, it's um, I, I think it's it's great in terms of um, this this object out there that's visible to the naked eye. You can go out and you can look at it and see this orange dot. You can look through a pretty basic telescope and see it, um, and it it gives the idea like, okay, we've got something to 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 work towards, um, and. I don't know. I think it's it's pretty hyped up right now in terms of like SpaceX trying to get there and NASA's plans to get there in the 2030s and uh, whatever that one company that's going to send people on a one way Mars one. Death. Yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, at this point, they've missed so many milestones that I don't I don't even know if anybody's talking Weren't they about supposed to launch this year. Originally, I don't, they, I, I don't know if they were supposed to launch this year, but they had a whole bunch of test things that they were supposed yeah, to I do. Yeah, I think so. That, that... They've, they've, they've readjusted their, their cal calendar 
But no, they're yeah. they're still going strong. I mean, they're they're going to do something. They'll do something. Yeah. What that is and whether or not it's worthwhile, we'll see. But yeah. Um, so in in terms of Mars, I think it's one piece of larger human exploration. I think it's a, a really cool um, and worthwhile effort to develop whatever technologies we're going to need to send humans there. But at the same time, I don't think that should be done at the expense of robotic missions to the outer solar system or science missions here that are just looking at our planet. Um, I don't know, going to Venus, looking outside of our solar system into the universe and even looking within our solar system for things like near Earth asteroids that we don't want to hit Earth someday. We don't want them to be too near. Um, there's sort of that limit of nearness becomes touching, which um, I, I don't want to have happen. Uh, whether I'm alive or not, I just um, so so Mars in a sense of like this is the human destination. I think that's really cool. Uh, definitely in one, it's one piece of the human exploration puzzle, though maybe not puzzle, uh, human exploration plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, how exciting again, is so that? To... And again, that's that's kind of like again taking taking a NASA JPL hat off and just yeah. sort of speaking personally. Um, you were going to say something. I was just saying. Jason, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's incredibly exciting to hear, um, you know, more than just one from one source. But uh, the fact that there's still interest in Venus is so exciting. And, and you know, the talk this week when we're recording this of, you know, possible plans between a, a joint mission with Russia and the U.S. Um, showing Venus some love. I mean, I'm so excited that there are active uh collaborations and thoughts and, and and just exploring other things besides mars mm -hmm. i mean we, oh, yeah, we have other close bodies it, it's fantastic and and yeah. venus is so so exciting venus in itself so, yeah 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 i mean mars is mars is great because humans could potentially go there whereas right. venus is definitely not a human destination yeah. but still really cool i mean the atmosphere acts like both a liquid and a gas it's so dense and just this past week, there have been um, there's been some uh, announcements about this gigantic gravity wave in the atmosphere that is the largest, potentially the largest in the solar system. And so there's a whole lot of cool stuff going on at Venus. And um, I, I I wish that it wasn't the case that we, as a society, not just NASA, had to choose like, oh, we're only going to go to this one this yeah. year, and we're only going to go to this one next year. Um, and by next year and this year, I mean like planning these missions that will eventually launch years in the future. So, um, yeah, I wish that weren't the case because yeah, I mean, every, every place you look at in the solar system is fascinating. And if you look yeah. at Uranus and Neptune, we've only been there with one spacecraft ever. And in like the mid and late eighties, like, yeah, it is so, so time to go back there. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much information that we can that we can find out just by going again and i say just it's it's a it's a big undertaking to just to go out to those to those places so um i mean again i think a, a lot of our, our our at least my personal hope is that you know we get more billionaires who love space who you know want to use their money towards space exploration um you know musk has personal goals in mind and wants to die on Mars. So, um, you know, I mean, Mars is there for him. That's his focus and that's great. But, you know, there are, and other people with business incentives too, Robert mm -hmm. Bigelow and, and that stuff going on. But there are others who just have a general fascination and interest in exploration. Um, so there's a lot of that underway as well. I just hope there are more billionaires who want to use their money in that regard um, just for the sake of exploration. Yeah, and, and I like that you say that in the sake of exploration because there are definitely organizations that are out there that are interested in exploring for commercial purposes, sure. and and that's kind of a, a uh, an, an idea that's out there. And there are organizations that are I can't think of any off the top of my head, but you know they're they're fundraising and they're they're working to go to asteroids to mm -hmm. mine resources. Yeah. Um, so in some senses, having that. Um, ability to get resources from from asteroids is really important to human exploration, but at the same time, if it's just for the sake of of profit, I'm I'm not as excited about that. 
And I, I will, that's a good uh, reminder, Amy, I wanted to point out on a previous episode, I mentioned that a friend of ours who will have on the show in the future, um, who is involved in asteroid mining companies, I think I said he was with Planetary Resources. He is with Deep Space Industries, I think, is the company he's on the board of. Okay. So, what does Deep Space, which one is Deep Space Industries? They're another Planetary asteroid. Resources. They're another asteroid they're, they're company. They're all asteroid mining. Yeah, okay. so Deep Space Industries is also an asteroid company, and they've released some cool images of spacecraft they plan to build that are going to go and land. And, like, ones that look like these giant things that go and, like, swallow an asteroid <laughs> and then, like, do the Spaghetti. mining and then, like, spit it out. So. Yep. That seems like a massive spacecraft to launch, but maybe it's a tiny asteroid. Yeah, probably target the small ones, but yeah, pretty epic. Start small yeah. and, and scale up, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's that's so, how engineering works. Just scale so, it up. Yeah, <laughs> easy. Uh, Amy, I know you've seen this, and Jason, I don't know if you have, but have you seen Moon? Um, yes. The, the the film Moon. No, I have not. Uh, oh, you I love it. I it's so good. It. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. Um, yeah, I, no spoilers. I, I, but no speaking spoilers, of mining, bring it up obviously the moon. Discussing mining, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's. That's I think that movie thing. is one of the best like sci-fi space movies I've seen ever because it's like it's out of the realm of reality and that it's technology that we don't currently have. But it's like it's not insane. It's just like real enough to really fuck with your head. And so that, it doesn't have like, space magic. For me, that's really good sci-fi. <laughs> I would recommend it to anybody listening. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I will second that. And Apollo eighteen, spoiler alert, there are no <laughs> there are no rock spiders that or rocks on the moon that turn to spiders and infect your blood <laughs> and make you see crazy things and then make lights turn on in your lunar module magically. Um have you seen Apollo eighteen, Jason? Yes, I have. <laughs> oh my god. Apollo eighteen. Those of you watching on YouTube, let us know your thoughts on Apollo eighteen in the comments because oh my I've god, that would be insane. Can, can that I, was like a I big thing with the, the UFO it. crowd, obviously, yeah, because they think course, it's real. Yeah. So yeah. I'm gonna yeah. put in my YouTube comments right now. Uh, there were not that many GoPros inside the lunar module. Yeah, <laughs> I love I love the idea that there's like all of a sudden this like secret yeah. mission to the moon. They magically had like 15 more cameras right. and somehow got all the footage back yep. without recovering the film canisters. And then it just gets Gotta worse. I love it. Space <laughs> yep. magic. It's great. Of course, that would be a big movie with the UFO world. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that movie is all kinds of awesome bad. Anyways. Glad you love it so much. <laughs> it's Apollo. How can I not love it? And um, uh, Jerry Griffin, who is the lead flight director on Apollo's 12, 15, and 17, and was a technical advisor on Apollo 13, was the technical advisor on Apollo 18, which is why it looks really good and is like pretty accurate until he told me he like stepped out and was like, nope, it's, it got <laughs> insane. I'm done. I'm out. So, That's yeah. I thought that was a really good, like, even an Apollo flight director can't stomach how yeah. ridiculous this movie got. <laughs> but the costumes look good. I actually got to try um, on one of the spacesuits from that movie. Nice. Yeah, it's like a full replica suit. It costs like $16,000 a week to rent from this company in West Hollywood because it has a cooling system. So it needs mm. a human to monitor you at all times. It weighs like 85 pounds. It was nuts. And were you just swimming in it? Like, did your arm? Oh yeah, go? it's like made for a six foot tall man, and I'm a four <laughs> foot eleven woman. That's awesome. Standing up really tall with a little bit of lift in my shoes, like it was nutty, but yeah, it was fun. Um, I know this is like usually the way we end the show, but I feel like well, maybe we should do a beer check first. Uh, I'm out. How weird! But you guys I, had, I you had you, my glass. You I, guys I, had bigs, <laughs> but I'm out. I know, but I only have this much left of my big beer. <laughs> And Amy, I appreciate your um, patriotic glass. I've got a patriotic glass as well. Ah, time to get star-spangled like hammered. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm rocking the uh, Apollo 11 for all mankind oh, 70s nice. vintage glass today. Um, but yeah, this is usually how we end the show. But I feel like this is a good segue now. I don't know, but there's also like, I'm almost on the beer. Yeah, so no, we, we, can, we, can, we can work toward the end. So ask it. Yeah. We'll, we'll stretch it out. Our, the question that we ask now. everybody, this is 
it's all it's all on the table right now, Al. Um, the, the question we ask all of our guests, and this is just coming very naturally off the idea of sort of going to Mars, but also wanting to go to other places. If you could go anywhere in the solar system without worrying about things like how to survive the journey, no radiation, food, aging, whatever, all of that's away. Just if you could go anywhere in the solar system, where would you go and why? That's a good question. Um... I would probably, you said, you, did you say universe or solar system? Solar system. Okay. Uh, I would go to Enceladus. And huh. the reason I want to go to Enceladus is because um, I want to go to Saturn. I want to see the rings. I want to see the rings cast a shadow on the planet. I, I want to be close to that. But also Enceladus is really fascinating because it's warmer on the South Pole than it, that, than it otherwise would be. There are geysers shooting out. Um, we think that there might be geothermal vents under there. And if that's the case, when you look at geothermal vents on Earth, they're teeming with life. It's not to say that, that that's what's going on there, but um, like the idea of being able to go there, there in person and, and check it out is fascinating. Um, and I just, I love Saturn. I think it's really cool. Um, I was, uh, where was I? This was a couple of years ago. I went to uh, Camp Del Corazon. It's uh, a camp for kids with, um, I don't know how to, de how to describe it. It's a, it's a camp for kids with, um, like heart conditions mm -hmm. and it's, it's a great place. And I went to go talk about space and the stars and, uh, point at the Milky way and stuff like that. Um, and you, you, when you go to camp, uh, which I never did as a kid, you have to pick a camp name. Um, and so I picked the name of a, of a moon around Saturn minus, um, and so that was my, my nickname around the camp. Uh, but I just think Saturn is fascinating. There was just an awesome image of one of the moons of Saturn going through the rings, mm -hmm. kind of disrupting some of the rings. Yeah. This was just released yesterday, I think. Um, I don't know if in the podcast you can make it like pop up on the screen or something like that in the video. Uh, we I'll have find, space magic I'll find on the show. Video yeah. Is and, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jason's um, good at space magic. All right, cool, cool. Um, yeah, just, you know, fix it in post, I guess that's what they say. That's so right. um, We're in Hollywood here, for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think that's where I would want to go. I mean, I say Enceladus, but if I'm there, I mean, I'll probably explore some other places around the Saturnian system, like Titan and stuff like that, too. So, well, I mean, like, once I'm there, I have a ship and I can fly around, right? I'm good. Not <laughs> well, that's, get, like... that's bending the rules of this hypothetical, <laughs> but uh, fantastic answer. I, I... yeah applaud that that Enceladus is my number two Titan's my number one only because um I think visually it would be more fun to to check out but uh you know both are are incredibly exciting uh, potentially astrobiologically speaking um Titan you know for an entirely different type of life a methane based life but the the geysers on Enceladus and, and just so much going on there I am so fascinated by that moon and I can't wait till we do more exploration there yeah, Titan is Titan is fascinating. I mean, they have they have an entire, and it's not a water cycle. It's basically the methane cycle, where you you've got lakes and you've got precipitate. Ah, uh, so cool. Yeah, it's yeah, it's so nuts. That's yeah. Jason and I are both on like Team Titan for this question, but <laughs> it's just it's just the fact that it has so many Earth like characteristics, but it's so different, but also yeah. has the right chemistry. It's bizarre Earth, just, yeah. Just, like, it is. It's Bizarro Earth, only, you know, sadly without Bizarro, Kramer, George, and Jerry. I know. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> that we know of. That we that know, we know maybe, of. That's maybe, right. Uh, what's his name? Kyle. Is his name Kyle? Kyle Feldman and... No. I forget all their names. It is Feldman. The Bizarro George. Yeah, Feldman. Yeah, oh. there is Fel Feldman is Bizarro <laughs> right. Newman. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kevin is Bizarro Jerry. Can't remember the other two. But yeah, maybe they do just like live in a little mirror image of Jerry's apartment up on Titan. Yeah, and no they're way. probably there. Wanna, Don't go in their that, fridge that without building. asking. <laughs> Never eat the olives without asking. <laughs> that building at JPL that says science on it. Um, I mean, one of the things that they're they're doing are um, like miniature experiments related to the Titan atmosphere and Titan lakes and what happens under these extreme temperatures with different gases and liquids. And it's it's super cool. That's so cool. Literally and also figuratively sorry for that <laughs> terrible um jason have you been to jpl i have not i applied for a well, job that... there and didn't get it but no did I, you i didn't I, know that i'm um, sorry that, was, that wasn't me sorry okay 
Okay. Well, I like well, you a lot more now, so. <laughs> um, well, we'll have to change that in the future, and that's very easy to change, so. I would like that very much. Yeah. That there's there's so much just like just weird stuff going on on that, that lab. It's like the one thing I love too about JPL, and this is the thing with a lot of NASA sites, is that they're all nature preserves or like near natural areas. Yeah. So it's like you see somebody test driving a Mars rover, and then oh look, a deer. Like, <laughs> why do these two things go side so by epic. side, and yet yeah. it works? I know I have to be careful when I'm walking to my car at the end of the day as I'm walking out of my building if I'm looking down at my phone I really have to look up and make sure I'm not going to walk directly into a deer and wow. um, I've had a deer come up to me and try to get my burrito once at lunch <laughs> like no be yeah. no 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 this is my burrito I am not giving you any of it um, deers, deers love burritos taste. too yeah. Yeah. yeah and I was at Kennedy and at Kennedy Space Center we had to stop our vehicle the driver got out picked up a tortoise moved it across the road mm -hmm. we got back in we continued driving and there were oh, signs gosh. everywhere, like look under your car at the end of the day to make sure there are no alligators wow. that are going to bite your ankles. So <laughs> Alligators? Uh, oh, wait. oh, yeah. Kennedy. yeah Kennedy. I, don't, yeah. I don't remember. But yeah, it's, I, I mean, remember. the giant swamp. And I saw dolphins at Kennedy once. So uh -huh. it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's cool. And then it just makes me think, nice. especially at Kennedy, the environmental impact of launching rockets. It's amazing that there can be wildlife on that island at all yeah. with the yeah. amount of, well, not currently, I guess, not as much, but like with massive rockets taking off all the time. It's just like, how do you live in this environment and like not leave yeah. mm -hmm. animals? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't know about other places, but I know Kennedy has, it's, it's not a, it's not a park ranger, but they have a person who's, whose sole job is to make sure that the animals are safe and protected and everybody's following the, the rules to, and guidelines to make sure that those animals are, are safe yeah. on, on, the, on the area. Nice. Um, so, here in California, in addition to JPL and um, Armstrong and uh, Ames Research Center in the Bay Area, there's also uh, part of the Deep Space Network, which is a series of antennas around the world that we use to communicate with spacecraft that are out beyond the orbit of the moon. And when you go out to, uh, it's called Goldstone, when you go out to Goldstone, um, there are burrows out there, like wild donkeys that are just wandering around the grounds and... Um, you just kind of got to watch out for them as you're driving down the road or when you get out of your car. That's, They're not, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. My voice is just dying. Um, that's awesome. And I went to, speaking of the DSN, um, I went to the Deep Straits Network outside of Canberra in the city called Tidbin Villa, which took me ages to say without stumbling over it. This is, of course, in Australia. And um, I had half a day off or, or, you know, I had a thing at night one day in Canberra and I had wanted to rent a car and drive out there. And I was so glad that I didn't have to drive because kangaroos are roadkill out there because it's on a king. It's on a nature preserve. Yeah. And there's kang there's wild kangaroos everywhere, and the road slopes down such that there's water that collects at the side of the road. And at sun sunrise and sundown, the kangaroos come and eat the grass on the side of the road. And there were dead kangaroos everywhere, and there were kangaroos hopping across the road. And like you're only going 35 kilometers an hour, like any faster, and you wouldn't be able to dodge all the kangaroos. It was insane. And then I looked up at like you know the 70 meter dish talking to Voyager 2, and then oh look a sheep. It's so weird. It's like it's like the height of technology in space and then like nature. It's just odd. <laughs> You'd never put those two things together, but I love that for NASA, NASA that like this weird pairing of like, yeah, NASA and nature. Yeah, it's a great juxtaposition. I, I love it. That's the word juxtaposition. Look at me. See, two points for vocabulary. <laughs> See, you're you're wording good because I'm at the end of my giant beer. So <laughs> Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I'm I'm out of beer. And you're almost I'm out of voice, of so we should probably wrap it up. I'm out of voice. Oh my god, I can't believe this is going. And I have like a a full day shoot tomorrow. I gotta <laughs> go drink some lemon water or yes, something. This rest is not your gonna voice. end well. Ah, <sighs> sigh. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't think of anything else. I want to pepper pepper Lau with questions about. We can do it again another time. We can always do it again. Yeah, yeah. I have I more beer. So. You have. I know you've got more beer, and I know you've got more. I'm sure you have more weird space stories. And yeah. Well, beer okay. Stories. So here's here's here's, here's I'll, how about how about I share this as sort of a closing thing because I All was right. I was on another podcast about space and beer, and at the end he was like, "So was there anything else you wanted to say?" And I said, "Uh, 
no. And that was the end of the classic. (laughs) So uh, you you had asked about sort of stories about JPL or or something like that. And so uh, one of my favorites was I, um, I had set up a meeting with somebody who was working on curiosity. uh, And this was uh, late 2012. I don't even remember what the meeting was about. But the day of the meeting, he sends me an email and he says, I'm so sorry, I have to cancel. I thought you scheduled this meeting on Mars time, not Earth time. Because at that point, they were going on a 24-hour, 40-minute Mars clock right. versus the 24-hour Earth clock. And, and, I, and, and I had only been at JPL for maybe a year and a half. And I thought, this is my life now. This is what happens here. That's kind of amazing. Wow. Yep. Did you have to live on Mars time after Curiosity landed or no? Nope. You weren't you weren't up, so you didn't have to do any no. of that. Okay. Yeah, that was that was the operations team. So yeah, um, I mean, I got to see them and and hear about them. And you know, when I was leaving work at the end of the day, and they were coming into work, I got to to see that. There was actually one family who, um, because it was in August and the kids weren't in school, they moved a time zone every day as a family, mm. and um, they did that for several weeks, and then that was that was it. But that's that's yeah. rough. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Good for them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there have yeah, been there have been instances where I've connected to teacher groups in Thailand or something like that, and I've been at work in two in the at two in the morning for that. But um, nothing like as steady as that hour yeah. shift they would do. But every that's but that's like the normal one-off weird time zone meeting this is like right. yeah, yeah for, is, they do it for what 90 days so about, for 90 yeah. days you shift you add 40 minutes onto the day every day and then gradually that's like you know you'll line up for a day and then you're just slightly off and off and off and off and off until you're just completely opposite and then you cycle back around because mars's day is for, what 40 minutes longer than ours it's like 39 minutes 39 and minutes 30 some seconds so yeah. they just round up to 40 to make the math easy but yeah, I mean, it starts out it's great not. because it's like, oh, eight, eight o'clock, and then the next day, eight forty, you get forty extra minutes of sleep, or or however, however you want to use that time. But then, yeah, then it drifts later into the day, and then, yeah, and then it's weird. Yeah, and yeah. Then you have to I've, cancel meetings. Yeah, I've just read about people living on Mars time just for that thirty days to like get the mission sorted, and just sounds all kinds of nutty. And that like that's when your best brain power has to happen for like getting settled into a new mission. It's just like, whew. Get mm-hmm. on, you guys. Get on, you yeah. nerds. You're, yeah. That's why you have the good brains. <laughs> yeah. And um, J, JPL does a nice job of taking care of those people so that, you know, they're, yeah. they're yeah. Nice. Nice. Good on you, JPL. High five. I still have high five there for everybody watching the, uh, not watching the video. <laughs> um, you, all right. Yeah. So I well, guess we should uh, tell people where, oh my God, as my voice really goes, I guess we should tell people, Lyle, where can people find more of you on the internet? Not that you necessarily tweet about space all the time, but, you know, if they do want to find uh, more of you. More of me on the internet, specifically unrelated to my work. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Both of those are at Lyle Tav. That's L-Y-L-E-T-A-V. And that's because my last name is Tavernier and it's hard to spell. So I just give a short version. That's, yeah, solid, solid, solid choice there. Um, awesome, cool. And Jason, where can we find more of you? I'm always on Twitter at Acentric. That's A-C-E-C-E-N-T-R-I-C. You can also find stuff I do at RoguePlanet.tv and uh, I guess Acentric.com. Awesome. All right. And of course, I am Amy and you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at A-S-T Vintage Space. That's vintage like 1950s and space like the sky. I'm not going to spell it right now. Um, and of course, if you want to never miss an episode of the Punk Rocker Moon Talker podcast, uh, I said it right that time. <laughs> um, if you're watching the YouTube video version of this, you are on my personal YouTube channel, which is just under my name, Amy Shira Title. If you'd like to watch the video version, you can find it on YouTube. If you would like to listen to the audio version, we will have links for the audio download in the description below. Um, I probably should say that up front next time instead of after you've sat through an hour and a half of podcast <laughs> on YouTube. But that's okay. We're okay with that. Yeah. Um, 
So, yes, of course, as always, guys, if you have questions for our guest, questions for us, ideas, you want to weigh in on the things we've talked about, anything at all, sound off in the comments below, especially if you have people that you would like us to reach out to to talk to and also beers that you would like us to drink because we are alcohol enthusiasts and we will take your recommendations. Yes, please. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Lyle, thank you so much for taking time on your Friday off to sit down and talk about your work when you don't have to be working. Um, but I don't feel so bad because you also got to have a beer at 2.30 in the afternoon. So it's all right. Um, well, thank okay. you so much for the opportunity because uh, it's not every day that I get to uh, have a beer at 2 in the afternoon <laughs> and talk about space and beer. So awesome. thank you. So happy to help. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next episode. Cheers. Cheers.